is going to come from Acts chapter 10, verse 34 to 43. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were opposed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging on a tree, by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God and to be judge, to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Praise God for his word. or timid you are. Let's see if you can identify them. Anybody? Alligator? No. This is muk tuk, a Greenland delicacy. Usually served frozen, it is a combination of whale skin and blubber. It looks a little bit like licorice, because you have the black whale skin and then different colors of blubber, which are white and red. It's a delicacy and very delightful. Who came closest? Who said alligator? <laughs> what is this Lao soup? Close. But no banana. This is the famous dish, Gangkai Mok Dong, better known as white ant egg soup from Lao. What is it composed of? White ant eggs. You see them there? White ant embryos. And for extra sour taste, baby white ants. It is also a delicacy in Lao, and they love it there. What does it taste like? Well, it's a little bit tangy and sour. How many of you would try it? All right. I don't think I can get it that far. <laughs> ah, my favorite, my favorite. Tarantulas. Fried tarantulas from Cambodia. Now, the Cambodians haven't been eating them for that long. In fact, they started eating tarantulas during the Khmer Rouge because food was scarce and so was money. But as they began to eat more and more fried tarantulas, they realized that they're tasty little critters. What do they taste like? I've had them before. And they taste a little bit like crab and lobster. How many of you like lobster and crab? Word on the street is Gerald Sr. could take about a dozen or two dozen of these tarantulas. Is that right, Gerald Sr.? All right, who said tarantula first? <laughs> what do we have here? Close. Any, anybody else mention or guest? Come on, youth. What are you guys learning in high school and middle school? 
These are locusts. And which country eats them? Close, very close. A country close to Egypt. In fact, Israel enjoys locusts. Do you know why? Because locusts are one of the only insects that are considered clean. Look it up, Leviticus 11.22, that you may eat locusts of all kind, including the bald ones, like Timmy. And so what do these locusts taste like? And how many of you would dare taste these locusts? There we go, there we go. Well, they taste a little bit like shrimp. How many of you guys have had salt and pepper shrimp or salt and pepper squid? Yeah. So these are salt and pepper locusts. Try them one day. All right, Justin, you're the daring one. And finally, can anybody venture a guest to this delicacy? What did you say, Stacey? It is definitely jellied, but what is the animal inside? Jellied moose nose. Now, a nose isn't exactly the, the, the part of the anatomy that you think of eating, but it's actually quite tasty. And the Canadians, yes, the Canadians enjoy eating different parts of the moose. And in particular, they take the nose and then they broil it in a particular broth, shave away all the nose hairs, and then boil it some more. And eventually that broth congeals into jellied moose nose. How many of you would try the jellied moose nose? Joyce. <laughs> well, brothers and sisters, today we come upon one of the most important passages of Acts, in chapter 10, where we see there is no division. It's a seminal passage because within Acts chapter 10, we learned that there's no Jew or Gentile, that there's no preference from God from calling his servants. There's no partiality in the foods that we are to eat. There's no prejudice in culture or ethnicity, and there's no limitation to those that can be baptized in the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Father God Almighty, we are so thankful for this opportunity to worship you in the sanctuary in spirit and truth. We pray that you pour the Holy Spirit upon our hearts. You open up our ears and our minds and our hearts, especially if we're tired, that we may meditate upon your word, remember it, and live it. We thank you, Lord, for this drastic paradigm shift that there is no division in the kingdom of God. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. And so let's start with the first point, that there is no preference for calling servants in the kingdom of God. What we see there is that there are several servants called in Acts chapter 10. And the first is Cornelius. Cornelius is a centurion. Do you know what a centurion is? It's a commander in the Roman army. And centurions had great power. They said a word, and their cohort did their bidding. Why centurion? Centurion comes from the word century. Century means? 100. And so centurions would command between 80 and 100 Roman soldiers. Cornelius was exemplary, but he was unique because Cornelius was a devout man that feared God, and so did all his household. He gave alms generously to the poor, and he <laughs> prayed continually to God. That's what set him apart as a centurion. And one day at the ninth hour, he saw clearly a vision of an angel of God say to him, Cornelius. 
this strong, devout man of strength and courage trembled and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your praise and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God, and now send men to Joppa to bring back Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying by Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. Cornelius wasn't a Christian, but yet he was a devout man. And so God chose to use him. The second person we see that is called as a servant of God is Peter. Peter. He's one of my favorite apostles. How about you? He's brash, unassuming, and always seems to be putting his foot in his mouth, right? He's not afraid to speak up, to ask questions, and to fight for the gospel. And God uses Peter. He calls him not only as a disciple and apostle, but later Peter is the rock of the church that God builds. And so in this passage, Peter gets a vision from God. And we'll see that vision a little bit later. But here, after pondering the vision of God, the Holy Spirit says to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And so Peter does what he always does. He goes down with the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. And what reason are you calling me? And so they reply, Cornelius, a centurion, was called by an angel of God. His name is Cornelius. He's a devout man. And he's calling you to come meet with him. Come with us. And so God uses Peter time and time again, but this time to meet with Cornelius first Gentile that is baptized in the kingdom. God uses Cornelius and God uses Peter, but he also uses two servants and a devout soldier. Their names remain unwritten in this book. They're often an afterthought. But I submit to you that they're just as important as Cornelius and Peter. For if they did not say yes to the centurion and go down from Joppa, Peter never would have met with the centurion. The centurion never would have come to faith. Christianity would have remained among the Jews. But because these two servants and this devout soldier said yes and traveled down to Peter, Peter then got the message, and he went back to Cornelius. Cornelius heard the gospel, and he was saved. And the gospel was available to all Gentiles. So God uses men like Cornelius that are extraordinary centurions and commanders. He uses people like Peter that are brash and unafraid. But he also uses those whose names are unwritten or an afterthought in the book of life. Each and every one of you is important and calls you to a certain role. Some of you he may call to speak the word of truth, to share the love with your hands and feet. To others, it may be just barbecuing the backyard as we invite individuals to hear the gospel. And for some of you, it's merely inviting your friends and family to sit by you on a seat in a pew in a church on a Sunday to hear the word of God. Last week, Pastor Chris shared about Edward Kimball. I got to confess, I'd never heard of him. Have you heard of him? But I definitely heard of D.L. Moody, Billy Sunday. What a name for a preacher, Billy Sunday. Billy Graham. And so this past week, I spent some time researching Edward Kimball and learning more about him. Turns out there's really not much to the story. He's just a regular guy like you and I. 
that he was faithful. And he taught Sunday school every Sunday for year after year after year. Nobody knows his name. Nobody except for D.L. Moody. And it was on D.L. Moody's 17th birthday that he came to faith that Edward Kimball pursued D.L. Moody time and time after again in Sunday school, at his job. And that one day when he was 17, that he said, Moody, are you ready to be baptized, to believe in Jesus Christ, your Savior and Lord? And from that day on, the rest was history. D.L. Moody is known as the greatest evangelist of the 19th century, founded Moody Church and Moody Bible College. And Moody made a pact with God that he would not let the sun go down without sharing the gospel with one individual. Can you imagine that? Our discipleship group has trouble enough sharing the gospel in a week or two. We always remind each other, hey, have you shared the gospel? Nope, <laughs> it's a busy week. But D.L. Moody said, God, I will not go to bed until I share the gospel with one person. And he did a lot more than that. And one of those people is F.B. Meyer, who became a pastor and a theologian. And F.B. Meyer shared the gospel with J. Wilbur Chapman. There's not much research on J. Wilbur Chapman. But J. Wilbur Chapman preached one Sunday to a young boy named Billy Sunday. And Billy Sunday became one of the greatest preachers of the 20th century. The same is true of Mordecai Ham, a country bumpkin preacher. You can't even find his name in the books of history. But you definitely know Billy Graham and the impact that he's made. And so God will use you if you only say yes whether it's preaching the word of the gospel with your tongue, it's helping out with the barbecue as we reach out to international students in September, or it's just sitting by a friend in the pew. Mark 16, 15, one of my favorite verses. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. God will use you if only you allow him. Second point is there's no partiality in food. You guys didn't do so well on the quiz, so I'm going to give you a few more pictures. What is this? Come on, Chinese. Pig's feet, yes. You see the two who's, right? Come on, you can just go a block away to delight and buy these pig's feet, right? Who said pig's feet first? I'm going to wake up one of the youth. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Who had this last Sunday? What is it? Intestines. Yes, yes, yes. It is a favorite dish of Asians, right? And it grosses most Caucasians out. <laughs> All right. Who said, uh, who said intestines first? I am bad aim today. All right. Last but not least. I don't, I don't know if Israel's here, but Israel cooks this very, very well in the backyard. Pork belly, yes. Delightful pork belly. I'm getting hungry just looking at that, aren't you? Now, the second question is, what do all three of these foods have in common? Unclean, right? Leviticus 11, 26 to 27 tells us that every animal that parts the hoof but is not cloven-footed or does not chew the cud is unclean to you. Everyone who touches them shall be unclean. And all that walk on their paws, like the cute little dogs that many of you have among the animals that go on all fours, are unclean to you. And so before Acts chapter 10, you couldn't eat chitlings, chitterlings, pig's feet, intestines, and liver. But Acts chapter 10 completely reverses the paradigm so that you can now enjoy pork belly. 
and not feel guilty. Peter is a devout man just like Cornelius. And as he's praying at the six-hour prayer, he becomes hungry. I know some of you guys are hungry right now. And as his hunger pangs continue, he falls into a trance. <laughs> have you ever been so hungry that you fell into trance? I have. It was on call one day after 24 hours. I forgot that I hadn't eaten, and I almost fainted. That's probably the way that Peter was. And so what happens? He saw a vision of God that the heavens opened in a great sheet Imagine a huge tarp that's white, falls from the heavens. We were at Julian's party yesterday, and they had this big tarp that goes round and round, and then you shake it, and then Julian was in the middle. And so I was thinking of the tarp last night and food. But think of that tarp falling down on the sanctuary. But in the middle, it's not Julian. It's all manner of food. It's chitlins. It's pig's feet. It's pork belly. It's locusts. It's grasshoppers. It's birds. It's lobster. It's crab. All of your favorite foods sitting right there in the middle. And God says, kill and eat it, eat it. And what has Peter said? No way. How can I eat that? That's unclean. I've never touched a pig's foot in my life. I've never eaten anything unclean. Why would I start today? I'm not starting. And so what does God say when Peter says, by no means, Lord, I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean? God says again the second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. Of course, this is Peter, right? He's got a thick head. <laughs> Doesn't go through once or twice. There's a lot of three-time things for Peter, right? And so it has to happen a third time. And after that, poof, like a cloud of smoke, that great sheet disappears. Paul says later in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 23 through 30, that all things are permissible. See, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor for whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Peter goes from no chitlins and ham hock to eating pigs, lobsters, crabs, all manner of foods. It's a great paradigm shift. And later you see in Galatians 2 that this teaching, this paradigm shift comes for fruition. It's a beautiful picture because Peter is eating with the Gentiles. He's enjoying those chitterlings for the first time. And more than that, he's having profound and blessed fellowship with them. That's the picture that God has in mind for you and I, that we enjoy fellowship. We enjoy food in the backyard and barbecue. And we laugh, we play volleyball and basketball, we encourage one another and we cry. But if you look closely at Galatians 2, 11 through 14, there's something a little bit sinister here. But when Cephas, who's called Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him face to face. That's Paul opposing Peter, who's eating with the Gentiles, enjoying a meal that he's never enjoyed before. And he condemns Peter because before certain men came James out of the circumcision party. 
And when James shows up in the circumcision party, Peter says, whoa, wait a second. Maybe I shouldn't be eating these chitterlings. Maybe I need to go back to where I was before because it's unclean. And so he felt judged. And see what happens to the others that are beside him? It's not just Peter that withdraws. Even Barnabas, the great encourager who we named our son after, is discouraged enough to draw back. That's the subtle terror of racism. See, it's not really about food in the end, is it? It's not about eating pigs and other unclean animals. It's that the gospel goes out to those that are not only Jewish, those that are not only Chinese, those that are not only Caucasian. And that's why there's no longer prejudice in culture. There's no difference in ethnicity. And God doesn't care about language or nationalism. You see here, the next day, Peter rose and went away with them. And some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. And Cornelius was expecting Peter. He had sent the two servants and one devout soldier. And Peter shows up. And this powerful centurion is so in awe that Peter would come that he falls face down and worships Peter. But Peter says, stop. No, I'm just a man like you. You don't need to worship me. And he talks with him. And he goes in and finds many other persons. And Peter says something so extraordinary. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or visit with anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So I was sent for you. I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. See, Peter's getting it now. It's not about food. It doesn't matter what you eat. It's about the fact that God loves these Gentiles. God loves the centurion. He doesn't care what his background is. He doesn't care that he's in charge of a hundred Roman soldiers. He loves that family, and he wants them to come to a saving faith. Cornelius, so excited. He echoes what Peter says, that four days ago about this hour I was praying at the ninth hour, and behold, an angel of God came to me and said, Cornelius, send two of your men and a devout soldier down the road in Joppa and bring back Peter. It's the same vision that Peter gets, and the same vision that Cornelius receives. That's God's working. Are you hearing? I love being in the Christian and Missionary Alliance. I know that I was called because it's one of the most diverse denominations. Even in the U.S., we have more than 2,000 churches, 38 languages. But what's most extraordinary Almost 50% of our denomination is non-majority culture. It's not white. It's Asian. It's Indian. From all parts of the world. And you can see an even clearer picture of that in Alliance World Fellowship, the umbrella of Alliance denominations. 6.3 million people. 22,000 churches. And now over 88 to 90 countries in the world that speak every language imaginable. It's beautiful. At the recent AWF meeting, 
And he sang some of your favorite worship songs. But every nation and every tribe sang them in their own language. It's beautiful. James 2.8.9 says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. There's no partiality in food, no prejudice in culture. Tell me who that is. Who's the black man? Come on, sports guys. You got to learn some history. He's a famous Olympian runner. He won at least four gold medals. Jesse Owens. But more importantly, what is the white German man next to him? Luz Long. And at that 1936 Olympics, on the cusp of the World War, Jesse Owens came in as a favorite. Oh, I forgot who. Oh, you got it. <laughs> Jesse Owens arrived in 1936 in Berlin as the favorite to win many races, especially the, the long jump. He had already set a record, I think, of 26 feet or 28 feet. But as he was preparing for the qualifying round, which was only 23 feet, he saw this tall German practicing, a symbol of German supremacy, the Aryan right. And so he became a little nervous. He double faulted. He crossed the line after the first attempt. And all the Nazis in the crowd were cheering that he would fault again. And so he ran as fast as he could, and unfortunately, he passed the line again. He was so nervous, he was trembling. And that's when the extraordinary happened. His competition, German Luz Long, made his way over to him in front of the large crowd of Nazis, nonetheless, shook his hand and said, hey, Jesse, you can do it. Look, it's only qualifying. 23 feet is easy for you. So why don't you set a line right here before the other line and just jump a little bit before. You can easily clear that 23 feet. So Jesse set the line a foot or two before, and he jumped and he easily cleared the 23 feet. The rest is history. Jesse Owens won a gold medal on the long jump there. But guess who the first person to congratulate Jesse was after winning that gold medal? His German Luz Long. In the second row of the crowd was Adolf Hitler. There's no prejudice in culture. Finally, brothers and sisters, there is no limitation to baptism. In Acts 10, 34 to 43, we see Peter open his mouth and say, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, you yourself know that what happened throughout all Judea beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. And then he goes on to share the good news of the gospel, that it was this Jesus that became flesh, roamed the earth, along with the disciples. At the end of his line, he chose death on a cross so that not only Peter and Paul and the rest of the disciples can know faith, but also this centurion as well. And while Peter was saying these things, you see the Holy Spirit falling upon all of these men. 
Remember the same thing happened in Acts chapter 2, right? You see the, the power of the Holy Spirit, the wind and the fire. And the same thing happens here again, that the Holy Spirit falls upon the family of the centurion and all the other men that are gathered. And they start speaking in tongues. See, when we're in tune with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit grabs a hold of our hearts and does miraculous things. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, and all who are made to drink of one spirit. Adolfo, I think that's you in the background. You have photobombed <laughs> the baptism. Is that right, Adolfo? This was Easter Sunday, and it brings me so much joy to see Andy, David, Brian, and Alicia come to faith. Different languages, different countries of origin, no prejudice in culture, no partiality in food. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Let us pray. Father God Almighty, we are so grateful for the lesson of Acts chapter 10. Because it has fundamentally shifted the paradigm of Christianity. It is no longer a faith of the Jews, of the Israelites, but is the faith for all nations, all tribes, and all tongues. No longer are we limited to what we eat, for everything of the earth is permissible. And so we thank you, Lord, that we can take the light in all the different foods in Manhattan and Queens and Brooklyn. We take the light that no matter what color our friends are or what languages they speak, they are welcome in the kingdom of God and that they too can be baptized. Father God Almighty, if there are any traces of prejudice within our hearts, if there is condemnation of those that live around us or walk the streets, I pray, Lord, that you would Help us to the seed of repentance, for you love them, and you have sacrificed your life for them. We thank you for this message today of Peter and Paul and the centurion. May it resonate in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.